T.J. Jakes, the Bible tells us that as we enter the water during baptism, we are identifying with Christ's death on the cross, his burial in the tomb, and his resurrection from the dead. When we rise from the water, this signifies that our old sin nature has been crucified, and we now have a new godly creature, godly nature. This sounds like we're not going to sin anymore. My explanation here begins with this requires explanation that is tied to Scripture which T.D. Jakes has not done. So we're going to move on. We've already looked at an excerpt at Romans 6, 2, 1 and 2, and 3, found out a little bit more about this issue by looking at Scripture. 6, 4, now we're looking at Romans 6, 6. For if meaning since we have been become we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. So he died for us. Our water baptism signifies that we're connected with his death. What he did for us is now ours. Our sins have been paid for. And that's verse six five. Now, in verse 6, 6, knowing this, that our old self, our old sin nature, was crucified with him, so that the body of sin might be rendered powerless. No longer has power over us if we, led, uh, if we uh, have died with Christ, and we have. That we should no longer be slaves to sin. We should no longer be slaves to sin. We're in that position. Remember, Romans 1.1 1, 1 starts it off with a key to the context. Romans 6.1, sorry. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin? It means that we can, so that grace may increase. Verse 6.2, may it never be. How shall we who have died to sin shall live in it? Still live in it. So it sounds like we have the option to go back to it. Exactly. T.D. Jakes doesn't seem to understand that. Moving on. The old self, literally the old man, that part of every individual, including believers, which controls the practice of evil, which has been crucified, i.e., put to death. Its control is deactivated, but not dead. Deactivated, but not annihilated. It's not dead. It can come back if you let it. At the moment, one becomes a believer when we believe. So since we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be, be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Now knowing this, we will still re well in the likeness of a resurrection body. Wow. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him. Romans 6.12 Therefore, here it is. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. That's the command. That means you can do that. If you couldn't, this Romans 6.12 shouldn't be here in the Bible. It says, now that you've been freed from the slavery of sin, don't go back to it. A sin, the sin nature remains in the believer. It can reign in the believer's mortal body and is characterized as having evil desires. That answers that. T.D. Jakes. Now, you need the power of the Holy Spirit before the day of Pentecost. The disciples were afraid of persecution and death threats. When the power of the Holy Ghost fell on the day of Pentecost, common fishermen turned from being cowards to being world changers and history makers. After they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they were afraid of nothing. Is this guy running a comic book or something? Prison did not scare the disciples, torture did not frighten them, and persecution just made them stronger. You see, they, they weren't super they didn't have supernatural qualities. Supernatural power of God followed them. But remember, Paul himself martyred them, saw to it that they were imprisoned before he became a believer. You see, if you need a breakthrough in your life, you need the power of the Holy Spirit and a baptism of boldness. 
baptism of boldness, those words are not in the Bible. The Holy Spirit will give you strength that you did, do not have in the natural. If you need this power in your life, all you have to do is ask. Luke 11, 9 and 10 says, So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will open for you. For everyone who asks receives. He who asks seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be open. The Bible also tells us that all of the following things happened to the disciples on the day of the Pentecost. Before I read this, ask yourself the question, were you one of the disciples in the first century? Suddenly a sound like a wind, a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. God is no respecter of persons. What he did for the disciples, he will do for you. It doesn't say that in the Bible. The disciples were one thing. Jesus' disciples who were Jews, they weren't Christians. They were under a different set of principles that God sovereign ruled over. Them. God sovereignty ruled over. This is about the disciples, I say, in Jesus' time with special circumstances in the establishment of the church. Not about Christians in the 20th century. Not all went well with the disciples in the first century either. Just consult your Bible, especially in the book of Acts. If you want direction for your Christian lives, dig into the epistles, the letters directed toward us in the church, and get direction there, not from T.D. T. D., T. D. James, Jake's, comic book account of how the disciples became supernatural supermen. You are not a disciple of Jesus in the first century before the New Testament Bible was even written. Christians have their directions, and it does not include becoming supernatural supermen. Open your Bibles. Open up your Bibles to the directions given to us in the epistles to the church. I'm going through the book of Corinthians. The issues there are quite different than the issues that the disciples were facing in the first century. Christians that Paul, John, Peter, the author of Hebrews, and Jude wrote these epistles, put things in perspective, not in Superman comic books. <clears> T.D. <throat> Jakes. Just as your salvation was a free gift from God, so the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Well, the word in, the infilling doesn't appear in the, in, the, in the text, but filling means control. So you get the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, upon believing. And as you follow the control of the Holy Spirit, directed through the epistles in your study of God's word, which are directly our responsibility as part of the body of Christ in the church, you follow those directions, it's up to you, and God will provide circumstances that makes the way for you. There's the power of God. In your weak humanity, you follow the directions of the Holy Spirit within you, as directed by your diligent study of the epistles especially, and the rest of Scripture. And things will be made supernaturally possible through the power of God. Consult the epistles, I say, in BKC. Believers today are not first century disciples of Jesus who began as Jews who were not Christians as part of the body of Christ until later. They were Jews following Jesus, as recorded in the Gospels, who will receive the Holy Spirit under different circumstances from today's believers. Believers in this age, in the 20th century, receive the Spirit at the point of faith alone in Christ alone, whereby, as they follow the Spirit's leading, them at a moment that is called being filled, i.e. controlled. There's nothing remarkable about that. If somebody tells you uh, the right thing to do and you agree to do that, you're controlled by what that person told you. The Holy Spirit 
isn't asking you uh, to do supernatural things. Especially look at 1 Corinthians. Some of the problems they had. They don't look to pa the Apostle Paul or Apollos or Paul or, uh, or uh, look to Jesus. Um, <clears throat> you're issuing the command of following who Jesus is. There's no supernatural spiritual gift you need to study scripture and follow the commands in the letters. So there is no second infilling of the Holy Spirit, by the way. You get baptized, water baptized once, and you get water, uh, Holy Spirit baptized once. One is symbolic of the Holy Spirit baptism, which is actual. Water baptism is symbolic of that. And you follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. That's called being controlled or filled with the Spirit. This is what, what T.D. Jakes is saying. This is not in the Bible. Believers who at a moment in time who follow the leading of the Spirit within them are at that moment at, at that moment filled, controlled by the Spirit. And then other moments, they are filled too. The same leading. Uh, sad to say, believers don't always follow regularly follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. It's it's a work in progress, and it's a difficult thing. So T. D. Jakes he co goes on in this letter. If you want this power in your life, all you need to do is ask. Uh oh. Begin by following these four simple steps. Of course, the the disciples didn't get this. It just came upon them. What steps do we have to follow now? Step one, praise him. Begin by being thankful to the Lord for his goodness. Think of back in the first century. Is this what the disciples were asked to do? No. Thank him for his grace and mercy in your life. Step two. Now pray this prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you that I am born again and on my way to heaven. I desire today to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. They didn't do that in the first century. Luke 11.10 says, For everyone who asks receives, I ask you to fill me with the Spirit to overflowing. Step three, now close your eyes and raise your hands to the Lord. This is simply a sign to the Lord that you surrender all to Him. So you have to surrender all to Him. Wow. The speech, uh, you know, Ephesians 1.13-14 says an individual who is an unbeliever believes and gets the Holy Spirit, and that's it. Now all you have to do is follow his leading, say, his prompting to pray, to say things, to study the Bible. There's nothing supernatural about leading the everyday life of the, of, of the church age believer. So I ask you to fill me with the spirit to overflowing. Now close your eyes and raise your hands to the Lord. This is simply a sign to the Lord that you surrender all to him. <coughs> Open your mouth and speak out by faith. Speak what? Say nothing in English. Wow. How do you know what? Your heavenly language will bubble up on the inside of you and come right out of your mouth. You must make the sounds and the Holy Spirit will form the words. This is bizarre. Don't worry about what you are saying or anyone around you. Lock in with God. Give him your tongue and give him the breath of your body. Just open your mouth and begin to speak. Let it out. Don't worry about what it sounds like to you. Don't be ashamed or embarrassed or timid. He's right there with you. If you pray to receive the Holy Spirit, you get it at faith. Well, and for some reason you did not receive, you must understand that there is nothing wrong with you. First, you don't pray. You simply believe and God gives it to you under his own power for you. On occasion, some people need a little help. Please feel free to come to the altar at the conclusion of any church service and ask a minister to pray with you. He'll probably prompt you to speak in tongues or something. <clears throat> you just let your voice go and start uttering stuff. Now, yeah, but the, the, the disciples in the first century spoke lang languages, known languages of the people around them who were visiting mostly Jews from all